to Commissioner Ken Meyer for us to begin. Thank you, Stella. Can you hear me loud and clear? Yes. The sound check there. Okay, thanks. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the BACP Empower Hour. I'm Ken Meyer, Commissioner of the Chicago Department of Business Affairs and Consumer Protection. Our goal is to help businesses and consumers get the information they need to succeed by sharing advice and stories from Chicago's entrepreneurs. Chicago is known as the city in a garden. Due to the city being home to a vast number of beautiful gardens, many of which are in Chicago's parks. And as we approach Earth Day, which is April 22nd, we wanna raise awareness and support for all Chicago's green spaces. With us today is Ben Helfen, Executive Director of Neighborhood Space. So let's learn how the organization is preserving and sustaining gardens across the city. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Ben, and thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Um, it's good to be here. Thanks. Before we get into the questions, can you tell uh, our webinar attendees a little bit about yourself, please? Oh, uh, Ben Helfand. Um, I am now officially a Chicagoan because I've been here for most of my life, but I was born in on the West Coast in Eugene, Oregon. And like many folks came here for college, um, came to the University of Chicago to, Div to Divinity School of all places, study the history of religion. But I was always uh, fascinated by sacred place, so that was my route to gardening. Believe it or not, was actually through the through uh, the sacred um, uh, kind of a circuitous road. I didn't get a, an environmental studies degree or a planning degree. It was a divinity degree. But that's, that's what that's an interesting background. Yeah. <laughs> so when did you kind of get into plants and, and green life and gardening? Um. My, Full disclosure, my dad is a landscape architect, okay. so I, I grew up with that kind of in the ether, and there was never a family trip, not even around the block, where we didn't go and visit a garden. So my entire childhood was visiting gardens um, of all different kinds, because he was just interested in wacky gardens and formal gardens and everything in between. And then my mom was a social worker, so she was an organizer. She was, you know, the people person. So... You put the two together and you get community gardens. Yeah. Uh, so I got I got it honest. That's 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 really an interesting background. Um, neighborhood space, as far as I know, is the only nonprofit urban land trust in Chicago that preserves and sustains gardens on behalf of dedicated community groups. Can you go into a little bit of detail about how what what and how neighborhood space achieves this mission? Sure thing. Neighbor space. Uh, we've been around since the late 90s. Um, there are some other land trusts that actually do own some gardens, but they're more focused on housing, even though they own a couple of gardens. So we are the only one that focuses, focuses exclusively on community managed spaces. But, you know, the way we work is uh, we, well, community groups come to us with visions, visions of open space for vegetable gardens, for arboretums, for sitting gardens, uh, school gardens. Uh, and they come to us for help because they want to preserve certain spaces. Uh, and we do not go out and find a space and say, hey, community, you should garden here. This is, you know, this is an assignment. They come to us with these visions and we do whatever we can to help them. Uh, sometimes it's pretty easy for us. Sometimes the group has it all together. They figured everything out. They just need us to lease a property uh, or they need us to work with MWRD or uh, Department of Planning and Development to try to acquire city owned land or the Cook County Land Bank. Other groups need a lot more help. They have a beautiful vision, uh, but they need fundraising help. Uh, they need technical assistance. Uh, and so we'll put together a team to try to uh, help them achieve their vision. Uh, where meet them where they're at, really. Yeah. So for one of those groups that's looking for, they want they're, they're organized. They want a, a community garden. They want to grow vegetables and some flowers, etc. How does neighbor space identify a potential lot for a community garden, and how does the city provide assistance uh, for your and support your organization? Uh, the well, I, yeah, I forgot to mention it's first and foremost, we are a land trust. So there are a lot of groups that come to us and they want to start a garden, uh, but it's not a love connection because they don't really need access to land. Uh, they already have land and then we connect them with other 
other organizations that can help with garden support. Uh, but if they do need access to land, and in terms of our connection to the city, uh, most of the sites that we protect, and we protect currently uh, about 140 sites across the city, a few of those we lease, but most of them we own, and most of those originally were city-owned. Um, that we do acquire private land, uh, and that's a kind of a parallel process. But for the 80% of the sites that do work, that do go through the city process, um, we are working with planning and development lockstep, you know, from the very beginning. Uh, and there are many, many steps along the way. Um, they help. They help us shepherd uh, potential sites through the city land acquisition process. And there are many steps. Um, sometimes it's frustrating for gardeners, but a lot of those uh, checks and balances are in there for very good reasons. The main reason being that we want to make sure that the soil is safe, that the land is safe yeah. for gardeners. <clears throat> so one of the big things that we do working with DPD uh, is, is in, and working with um, uh, 2FM, Fleet and Facilities, uh, is to make sure that the soil is safe. And that can take a long time. So sometimes we luck out, we work with the city, uh, and we do an environmental test to make to see if it's safe. Sometimes we luck out and we get a clean bill of health. Then we can move forward. And then it's just the normal city council land acquisition process, which in it, in its on, on its own can take six to nine months. Um, if there is an environmental issue, um, then it takes longer. And then we're working with 2FM and the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency uh, on the um, site remediation protocol process uh, to, to make sure that, that if, if it does end up becoming a garden or farm, that it is safe. Um, and that takes, that takes a long time. But once you do it, you don't have to worry anymore. So this is what yeah. I always tell the gardeners is like, let's take the time and do it right um, so we don't have to worry ever again. Um, the other thing that is is crucial about the city partnership um, is there's multiple funding sources that help support uh, gardens and farms. Um, in addition to essentially free land, the city charges a dollar for these for these lots. Um, as far as I know, we've never actually been charged the dollar. Um, it's more of a you know an honorary thing. Um, this is an we because of that we are the envy of many other urban land trusts in the country. Um, there are other similar organizations in places like Milwaukee and Baltimore. They do not have uh, land donated to them by the city in the same way that we do. It is very unusual and very special that the city would choose to make this, this kind of permanent investment in community open space. Um, so in addition to the free land, which has incredible value, there's also funding sources, the biggest one of which is the city's open space impact fee fund program which is funding collected by community area that can then go to support new open space. Uh, and neighbor space has been able to tap into that for many, many years um, to support new open space, paying for things like environmental remediation, access to water, fencing, uh, things that are like big infrastructure expenses that would otherwise be hard for uh, usually a more grassroots community group to be able to support. That's great. And I'm, I'm very, um, I'm, uh excited that you just know all the intricacies of working with the city in our departments. That's, uh, that's very, very impressive. So thank you for your uh, collaboration with the various uh, government departments. Um, you know, often when we think about beautifying vacant lots into gardens, we think of flowers. Um, can you share what other items are going to these spaces and how decisions are made as to about what to plant and when to plant. I know different plants sometimes have different yeah. seasons in our uh, planting. Well, what, what is our planting season, would you say, in Chicago? Um, about now. I mean, traditionally, although it's changing with global warming, the uh, Mother's Day was like the traditional yeah. kickoff season. Yeah. Um, and then people really try to push it to like Halloween, you know? Um, many, many gardens do season extension. Uh, it, and they do like cloches or hoop houses or greenhouses, and they can they can get a couple of more months out of it if they do that, um, or they do cold weather crops that can extend even into the you know I've been out there picking kale with and shaking snow off of it, so <laughs> you can go pretty far. Uh, you can almost get to like eleven months if you if you play your cards right, but it's not L.A. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in terms of what people grow. Uh, I mean, I mean, they grow everything. Um, it is, uh, uh, 
and and some a few gardens are I, I would say it's like a a, uh, a third, a third, a third is how we often think about neighbor spaces portfolio is there's like a third of the gardens that are really focused on vegetable growing. Almost everything they grow is edible. Uh, and then there's a third that are mostly ornamental. Uh, and then there's a third that are mixed. They have like a, you know, maybe they'll have a perennial garden or a native planting garden on half and then raise vegetable beds on the other half. Um, and that, 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 that rings pretty true. Um, People like to have flowers. Um, I, I often think of, there's a garden that we protect called uh, uh, the Ginkgo Organic Garden. It's a mm -hmm. wonderful garden uh, uh, on the north side that uh, is like a double lot. And they grow exclusively to donate to a food pantry. And they harvest twice a week during the season. And then they bring it over to the food pantry. I think it's called Vital Bridges is the pantry. And they always make a point of, of emphasizing that they don't just bring food, but they also bring cut flowers. And uh, the folks at Vital Bridges always say that the flowers are the thing to go first. So you got to feed, you got to feed people's stomachs, and you got to feed their souls. And community gardens really take that to heart. Um, people grow both. Um, there's lots of cultural specificity in terms of what people grow. We did a harvest study uh, almost a decade ago now with DePaul University, and they produced some maps, and we we actually went out and looked at what people were growing. Uh, and that you could see very strong patterns. You know, there's certain something like purslane, which uh, is sometimes considered a weed, but in in Pilsen and Little Village, they rightly recognize that it is one of the most nutritious things you can grow, and is very popular in Mexico. And they grew a ton of it. Um, so you see some cultural patterns that play out in the gardens as well. More tomatoes here, more peppers here, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Um, okay. I would also say you asked what people, you know, what else goes on in the gardens. There are many gardens where um, it, it's almost like growing things is not the main focus. Uh, there are some gardens where theater is the main focus and that the garden is a place to do youth theater productions. Uh, There's some gardens where actually more and more where play is the main focus, nature play. Uh, it's a major trend for neighbor space and the park district and the forest preserve where the garden is a place to host a uh, nature place. So kids are building huts and they have hollow logs and boulders and things like that. Uh, under the umbrella of open space, uh, neighbor, neighbor space doesn't care what you do. As long as it's open space, we will support it. That's great. Um, how do you recommend someone start a community garden or become involved with a uh, neighbor space? I suppose yeah. you know, community groups or block clubs that maybe are interested in uh, a garden, or there may be folks that a single individual says, "Hey, I want to help out. How can I, how can I kind of help out?" Um, so the first thing we we would often say is uh, we recommend that people don't just jump in and start a garden, uh, uh, you know, willing willy nilly. It's good to get involved in another garden first um, before jumping into your own because it is a lot of work and it does take a lot of organizing and certain specialized sets of knowledge. Um, and so a lot of people approach us, they're like, I want to start a garden right here. We're like, well, there's a garden a block away. Are you involved with that garden? Like, spend some time there, make sure this is something you really want to do. Um, and then let's work on a new garden, because it does take a lot of work and funding to create a new space. Um, so sometimes people do that, then they come back and they've proven themselves and they've brought together their neighbors and they've got a good plan and then it moves forward. But sometimes people just want to get involved in a garden. And so they connect down the street. Um, oftentimes I tell people to just show up. Um, I think we're a little bit predisposed in our society to expect things to be like a formal program. Uh, you're like, I'm going to pay 50 bucks and sign up for this program. Oftentimes community gardens are not that formal. They say like, show up on Thursday evening or Sunday evening. That's when we're gathering in the garden. If you do that, for a couple of weeks, then you're part of the garden. Uh, so it's about it's about connecting. It's about talking to people. Um, it doesn't always exist online. It's just right there on the block. <laughs> yeah, I like so, that. Uh, we know that COVID nineteen pandemic uh, intensified the food inequality issues uh, mm. all across Chicago and all, all really like, all across the United States. Um, especially experienced by many low to moderate income neighborhood neighborhoods. How are the neighbor space programs helping to address food 
inequality. And also for one of the larger or nice uh, community gardens that's producing a lot of vegetables in the middle of the summer, where do, where typically does all the food go to? Or how, how, is that, how does that leave the garden for people to actually consume, I guess is a better question. So I'll start with the last question is where does the gar where does the food go? Yeah. Uh it goes everywhere. Uh it is there's not one uh one outlet. So one of the things we've learned over the years is that uh it's it's very hard to measure how much comes out of the garden because people aren't gathering it, weighing it uh and taking it to market. Um they're they're bringing it across the street to the seniors in the neighborhood. Uh, they're putting it in a little pantry. Uh, they're bringing it to a pantry for a donation. They're taking it home and pickling it or preserving it for exchange or bringing to a farmer's market. Uh, they're, if it's an allotment garden, it's often going home with individuals or families. Uh, if it's a collective garden, it may go home with everybody who showed up for that harvest day. Um, and some of them end up at farm stands in the garden, um, which I may, I may note, uh, there's new city city policy to make farm stands a thousand times easier or yeah. legal at all, um, which is fantastic. So we're, we're thankful for that uh, improvement. Um, so it, it goes all over the place. People, uh, I don't know any garden that's growing food where there's not like five different outlets. Um, and that's, uh, that's the way we like it. Uh, it's good. What was the first part of the question? Um, uh, COVID. We're just talking about food inequality and, and um, Higher. Yeah, so there are, I mean, there are definitely gardens, neighbor space protected gardens and non neighbor space protected gardens, you know, yeah, there, there, there are upwards of 600 community gardens in Chicago neighbor space represents uh, 140 or so of them. So there's, it's a bigger pool than just us. Let's repeat that again. I don't think people realize that that's a big number. Say that one more time, please. Uh, there's upwards of 600 community gardens. Okay, different, different sizes and shapes. Yeah. And we represent about 140 of them. Uh, so it's a big impact. It's small, but when you add it up, it's a big impact. Um, and we actually have some statistics, statistics on this from the, from the harvest study. Um, uh, and there's even at that time, there was only like 500. So it's bigger now, but we found that it was about $1.7 million worth of produce grown in these gardens. Wow. Uh, and, and about five and a half million pounds of produce. So if you looked at one of an individual garden, it wouldn't seem that significant. But if you add them up, the impact is is quite substantial. Um, and if you look at other factors like food miles, the fact that this food is right in the neighborhood, um, that it's right across the street from the person who's eating it, the impact is even greater. Um, so in terms of COVID and food access and food security, uh, I think it's important to note that many of the community gardens in Chicago are in uh communities that don't have easy access to fresh fresh food. Um, that's often where land was available. So people would able, were able to make gardens because land was available. Um, during COVID, there, right after it hit, the garden community met, or leaders in the garden community met, and we had a discussion about how can we make sure that gardens stay open? There was a very quick understanding that gardens were an important source of not only fresh food, but also mental well-being, a place to connect outdoors safely. Um, and so we together, and actually with partners across the country, developed protocols so people could stay outside. And so there were all these very odd work days where it was, instead of working all together in the garden at the same time, we spread it out over nine hours uh, so people could still get into the gardens and keep them going. Uh, with only a couple of exceptions, almost all the gardens stayed open through COVID. Uh, and really providing a vital lifeline to fresh vegetables. Um, and then a number of the gardens, uh, and I think this is very crucial, were involved with um, uh, kind of networks in their community for mutual aid. Uh, and so when COVID hit, because of the networks in the garden, they were able to spring into action uh, and not just growing food, but also using the garden as a hub for fresh food delivery into the neighbors, into the neighborhood. Um, and it, it really highlights the, the important ways that community gardens function as social infrastructure, as well as physical infrastructure. The real power behind a garden is not just the garden itself, it's the people who are stewarding it. 
uh, and all of the skills that they have and the skills they bring to the table. And it really shows up in times of crisis like COVID because they're able to spring into action and help each other. And it, it worked uh, and will continue to work. Yeah, I like that. I like the fact that it's really having an impact on the neighborhood or with the community group um, and probably even with the leaders within that group as to who's going to water on what days or let's have a, a harvesting uh, Saturday or you know Thursday because things are getting yep. ready to be picked. Um, on the topic of food equity, <clears throat> part of the BACP economic recovery portfolio in the post-pandemic world is a community growers program. And thank you for Neighbor Space. Uh, you were selected to manage the program. Can you provide the purpose and the goals of the program and maybe folks listening today, how they may want to uh, get involved? Yeah, so the the uh, Chicago Community Growers Program grew out of the Food Equity Council, out of the Urban Ag Committee, uh, which had met for a long time trying to find solutions for uh, some of the food any persistent food inequality problems in Chicago. And through that, the the uh, Chicago Community Growers Program was was birthed. Um, and so neighbors, when the when the request for propose or, or the 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 call uh, for the opportunity came out, um, neighbor space, yes, we applied for it and we're thankful to have been awarded it. Uh, but we didn't do it on our own. We immediately went and partnered up with so many of the other urban ag organizations in Chicago, like Advocates for Urban Agriculture, Chicago Food Policy Action Council, Urban Growers Collective, The Navigator, Grow Greater Englewood, and Windy City Harvest. And we created this kind of working cohort um, with Neighborspace as the lead to apply uh, so that when we were awarded it, we were able to work together on administering this program uh, in a way that really pulled from this collective wisdom of all of these different organizations. Uh, neighbor space, I think, was the lead because we had a particular expertise in land, uh, but not necessarily an expertise in all of the other areas. So I think that's it's kind of a dream team, uh, uh, which I think is very important. Um, the goals of the program are to were primarily to lower barriers to food access or not food access, but land access. And specifically uh, on the south and southwest side, uh, focused on black and brown communities in Chicago. Um, and I think specifically on organizations and individuals that might have been left out from previous programs or not have access to the traditional funding sources for, for whatever reason. We, we know that there are so many farmers out there uh, who are hustling and have been doing it for years uh, on squatting on land or on borrowed land or on leased land, uh, making it work, feeding our communities, but they might have been too small or not connected to the right uh, resources to uh, make their sites permanent or take their operations to the next level. So I think the Food Equity Council and all of us recognize this. And the um, uh, this program was designed to try to connect with those folks and give them the support they need. Uh, and that's what that's what we did. So we put out a call. When was it last November? A little earlier. Um, and 300 farmers and gardeners applied to this. And we, with that cohort, winnowed it down to 18 initially. Uh, and we awarded 18 projects across the city uh, support. Each, each program had a different set of needs. Uh, 10 of them were new sites. Eight of them were uh, existing sites. So for some of them, it was about that they needed water. They had no yeah. dedicated water source. So every year they figured out, they borrowed it from the neighbor. Uh, or they figured out how to get access to a city hydrant, uh, all a rigmarole and makes it very hard to have a sustained growing operation. Um, other sites wanted a uh, season extension. So it's about a hoop house or a, uh, you know, one of those shipping containers that you can grow in, uh, something like that. Then other other projects, they, they uh, needed help acquiring land from a private owner or the Cook County Land Bank. So we've been stepping in to help them with that. Uh, and then there's a handful of sites where it is about new land. And for that, we've been sh working with them and shepherding them through the city land access, access process, uh, through the Chai Block Builder process, to try to find land that fits their needs. Um, and it's taken a while, because uh, good things take 
take a while to make sure that it's environmentally safe and that they have the and that they have the resources they need. But uh, we are coming through this successfully. You know, there will be new farms this summer because of this program. Uh, and we're just about to open up the second round in a couple of months. So there will be a few more sites uh, that we're able to support through this program. I, I would also say that this investment is a $2 million investment. Um, it's, there's no question that it's leveraging uh, a lot of other funding. Every single one of these operations, they're fundraising on their own. Uh, so they're all bringing to the table tens of thousands of dollars from philanthropy, from their neighbors, from, from their businesses, from selling their what they grow. Uh, uh, and then the city's even you know, leveraging more through open space impact fees, through the Chicago Recovery Program and TIF funding. And then philanthropy is coming to the table to turn that $2 million into, I'm not going to say double it, but... Um, this represents a major investment, possibly the biggest I've ever seen in 17 years of doing this in urban agriculture in, in Chicago. Well, thank you. That's just such incredible work. And I hope everyone listening today is, is very appreciative. I went out <clears throat> not so long ago, maybe actually last fall to be exact, to one of the, the gardens on the west side. And I was just amazed uh, until you guys collaborated and partnered and, then, and actually got them water, just kind of the elaborate uh, ways before they had water, the water supply, like as you suggested, borrowing from the neighbor, borrowing mm -hmm. from the fire hydrant, even maybe having a rain, uh, rainwater buckets and a, a kind of a rainwater system. So, um, sort of antiquated in this day and age in Chicago, which has had a water supply um, for, for many, many years, uh, and it's such a huge benefit to that garden, which is able to produce a lot of food, and then they they happen to sell it to the neighborhood farmer's market, which I think is twice a week. So all really good work. And again, that social element of just bringing people together from that community is just so um, helpful. And gives, it gives, um, there, there were seniors um, when I met with them that day and just gives them all purpose, right? A purpose and, a, and something to kind of collaborate with. And it's, it's, a, it's a great, great program. Um, changing topics slightly, as we're approaching Earth Day, April 22nd, is neighbor space planning to acknowledge and celebrate the day and let us know what you guys are doing if people can participate and additionally can you share a little off topic here can you share the climate and energy benefits of the community gardens so for earth day neighbor space is not running a specific event okay um, we don't run programs like that just as a matter of course we support the gardens running of programs like that so if you look through the list of neighbor space gardens, my guess is a quarter of them are doing something on, on Earth Day. Um, I know that you know there's a few sites that we protect with in partnership with the Bowmanville Community Organization. I know they're doing a big Earth Day cleanup. Um, I think we have three sites with them. Uh, I believe the Hardencito, the nature play site in uh, in Little Village, uh, is doing an Earth Day event. Uh, and then there are many more. Um, thanks. I, I, it's always nice when I don't even know about them because that's why that's how neighbor space is designed to be. You know, we're there to be behind the scenes, uh, but but it's the community's show. So uh, they are doing all sorts of creative things that that we love, and we get to do some of the boring stuff, like be their fiscal agent, so they can apply for grants uh, to support Earth Day events. Actually, right before this webinar, I got word that two of our gardens were awarded a wonderful new grant to uh, um, both in the South Shore community area, the Crandon Community Garden and the South Merrill Community Garden, both That's wonderful right. gardens. So uh, they are, there's going to be a lot going on on Earth Day, um, but it's a little bit, I think maybe a lot of us in the environmental world, Earth Earth Day can be the day where we try to sometimes hide inside because we're like, literally, we are, for us, every day is Earth Day. This is all we do year round. So for Earth Day, we're like, oh my God, this is crazy. Uh, <laughs> don't people know it's all Earth Day? So uh, yes, there's going to be a lot going on. I would give the same recommendation I would give to anybody wanting to get involved in a garden, which is like, just show up. Something's yeah. going to be happening. Uh, especially the way the weather has been, like even if there's not an event, people are going to be at the garden waking it up for the season. So, 
So you have a button that says every day is Earth Day. (laughs) I should. (laughs) It's a cliche, I know, but it is true. (laughs) And um, can can you just elaborate or just tell us some of the energy benefits of a community garden or just some of the other benefits of the community garden? Yeah, so I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't have like, a, you know, pat statistics on the energy benefits, but it's similar to the, to the food security benefits where I was talking about, you know, like $1.7 million in produce, if you aggregate these sites. So the benefits of a community garden are not, it's not one thing. It's multiple things that add up. So we know that there's substantial stormwater benefits for gardens, Yeah. for yeah. example, because it's not a parking lot. So it can actually, you know, the soil can absorb rainwater in those sites. Uh, We know that because of the tree canopy in gardens, that uh, it's helping alleviate the heat island effect in gardens. Uh, There's the food security bit. Um, We know that community gardens, because of the, you know, improved social cohesion in communities, because it gives an opportunity for people to work together uh, and increase the bonds in in the neighborhood. Um, many of the gardens are using solar. Um, so, but it's not any one thing. Uh, it's all of these things added up. Uh, we know that upwards of half the gardens are composting, uh, and they may have one or two compost bins, not a huge impact, but if you add it up over hundreds of gardens, this is thousands and thousands of pounds of, uh, food scraps diverted from the waste stream, uh, and it all kind of flies under the radar uh, because it's too small. But again, if you add this up, the impact is huge. I would do a, a shout out to Streets and Sanitation because we partnered with them this last year on part of the uh, uh, the compost pilot project. So we had six gardens, uh, including one that I believe is actually on the call, the El Paseo Community Garden. Another shout out there, um, uh, where the community gardens were accepting food scraps uh, at the gardens. Uh, and diverting diverting thousands of pounds from uh, landfills. Um, so it really, really does add up. Um, you know, piggybacking off of that the compost piece, I think it, it, important piece of gardens is that they're like an environmental hub for uh, for education. Uh, so it is a place where people come to learn about composting and gardening and fruit tree care and things like beekeeping. You know, there's dozens of gardens that are that have small apiaries. Um, like, yes, you could go to the Botanic Garden or the Garfield Park Conservatory and other park district locations, uh, but there's an even bigger need in Chicago and people turn to their community managed sites to learn these skills, which they will then take home to their backyards. Uh, we know that community gardens have an impact like an octopus that spreads out into the neighborhoods, into the parkways, into the backyards. There is a garden, the Fulton Street Flower and Vegetable Garden in Garfield Park, uh, an amazing site. Um, The original site was just two lots uh, Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Angela and Sam Taylor took it over more than a decade ago, brought it back to life to put in a a greenhouse in the back. Um, But the amazing thing to me is that when they started, it was just that garden. Now, if you walk around the block there, there's barely another open space in the neighborhood that isn't intensively grown upon. Vegetables, flowers, fruit trees, street trees. Um, So it has this kind of ripple effect in a neighborhood. Uh, And I think it's because people have the chance to learn in a hands-on way. They're not just going and seeing it. They're learning how to do it themselves and then bring it back home. That's great. That's great. And big shout out to all the volunteers and all the folks across Chicago that are participating in any community garden for that matter. That's it's important work. Um, so for those folks getting started, wanting to get started, um, share with our attendees a little bit about seeking capital to start and grow their nonprofit. Um, can you explain maybe even how neighbor space secures funding and capital and just some ideas for the yeah. uh, the local community group? Um, so oftentimes we're putting together a, like an investment package that pulls from different resources. So um, oftentimes there's some investment from the city through the open space impact fee funds or TIF funding 
uh, or often from aldermanic menu funds yeah. that will be that will pay for. There's some things that nobody else wants to pay for, uh, especially environmental remediation or water. Uh, these are very big expenses where you really need that public commitment, uh, not exclusively, but it, it's very hard to do without that public commitment. So we're thankful for that. Uh, and other cities are jealous of that investment. Um, so oftentimes there's that that investment from the city. And then we're bringing to the table, we're matching uh, neighbor space, doing private uh, uh, fundraising uh, with local and national philanthropy. Uh, and then we're, and then the community group is doing fundraising. Um, sometimes it's a third, a third, a third. Sometimes it's, you know, 50, 30, 20. Um, uh, you know, however we can put it together is what we will do to make it possible. Um, we want the garden leaders on the ground doing the fundraising in their community. Yeah. Um, we want them working with local businesses and neighbors and restaurants um, and sometimes, depending on the neighborhood, sometimes that means raising $20,000, but sometimes it means raising $2,000. Both are valid uh, and both contribute to the garden. And then we will work with our philanthropy team to try to bring in uh, the rest of the funding to fill the gap um, for fencing, for hoop houses, things like that. I would say that it rarely happens in one swoop. Um, it's not uh, like other projects where we would have all the capital up front. Uh, and sometimes this is confusing for partners uh, where they expect us to have, you know, like we have a $500,000 all ready to go for this project and it'll be built in three months. It'd be like, nah, you know, community garden, it'll be built in three to five years. It's an iterative space because it goes at the pace of the community. So sometimes it's about like, let's just get in there. We have a long-term vision. Uh, and maybe neighbor space has helped with the community design process, uh, but we have access to the land. Let's say the environmental issues are not on the table at the moment. Uh, in the first year, what do we do? We go in and we do we fencing and a couple of planters in the corner. That's it. That's all you do. You just and maybe a sign. Uh, you you activate the site the site in the first year. The next year you go in and you add another element, maybe a handful of raised beds and a fruit tree. Third year, you go in and you add something, you know, paths uh, and a and a stage, but you do it slowly and you have a chance to work with the community, gauge people's feedback, raise more money. Uh, and then at, at, you know, all of a sudden after five years, like the garden is thriving and, and filled out and there's nothing more to build. Um, that's often how it that's often how it happens. Uh, but it really is these three, the three sectors coming together. You know, yeah. the neighbors, philanthropy, and public investment. Um, and you really need all three to make it successful, generally. Do you find our local chamber of commerce are helpful? You know, BACP has a partnership with over 70 uh, neighborhood business development organizations, such chambers. And um, I'm wondering, is there a good synergy between, um, you know, the local groups and their local chamber? I think there's a lot of chambers that are involved with open space decisions in their neighborhoods. So when the community design process is happening, it's often the chamber that is part of that convening uh, and thinking through where the the growing space or the community space fits into their neighborhood. Um, and then there's also uh, chambers have a, a very strong connection to farmers markets. Yeah. Um, I think that's probably the biggest link that I see happening over and over again, where a farm will through the chamber, which is often sponsoring the farmer's market, uh, uh, connect in that way. Great, great, great. Um, well, again, I wanna give a big shout out to all the women and men who volunteer, help water the gardens, right? Help uh, turn the soil as it's planting season. It's um, it's a lot of work and I just, I think we should, we should dedicate this hour to all the folks all across Chicago really helping with our neighborhood um, gardens. Um, well, let me just change a little bit and talk a little bit more about you. When you're not running the nonprofit, what do you like to do to relax? I'm, I'm ashamed to admit that I do like to garden. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so it is, uh, you know, we hear from the gardeners and I feel it myself. It is great for mental well being. Like yeah. when you're, we, I love to weed. I love to prune. I spent last weekend pruning my apple trees, uh, and it felt great, uh, um, 
So I love getting my hands in the dirt. I don't use gloves. I don't recommend that to people, but I like to feel it, you know? Um, so, uh, I, you know, along the same lines, I love to be outdoors. I, I, I like to go hiking as much as humanly possible and get on a bicycle as much as I can. Uh, and I love swimming. Um, so I'll get to the lake and jump in the water, or go to the Y and do laps. Um, I, I've been involved with the Bloomingdale Trail Project uh, since the very beginning. That was actually my, my, my inroad into organizing and open space in Chicago. So I live four blocks from there. So I spend a lot of time up there. Um, and I got two kids and my wife, and we, we just explore Chicago as much as we can. Neighbor space is a good excuse to do that because it's a, uh, it's a good excuse to visit this farm and this nature place site and this trail. Um, my wife jokes, uh, like we should, we can't go anywhere without me being like, Hey, I think, I think if we take a right over here, there's going to be a, a little nature place spot and there it is. Um, but it's a great way to see the city. Yeah. Um, and it's a huge city. So, um, I'm a big fan of like tour internal tourism, you know, it's like, yes, we could go to O'Hare and, uh, leave the country, but we could also explore some of the nooks and crannies on, on the Chicago river and the Des Plaines and, uh, you know, some of the lesser visited Chicago parks and yeah. they're just, they're jewels. So yeah. we spend a lot of time doing that. That's great. And what is your uh, favorite items to plant? Or maybe again, that's also a seasonal question. Berry. Uh, no, I'm a, I'm a berry man. Okay. Berries, berries, berries. I call it my library. Uh, <laughs> I grow. I try to grow as many different berries as possible. I'm a little bit obsessed with foraging. So wherever I go, I'm like, I think that's a service berry and I can eat that. Or there's a wild raspberry. So in my own yard, I've planted eight different kinds of berries. Wow. Uh, and we will pick them all and make jam. Um, but I'm also that guy who goes with my son to the to the mulberry tree and puts a tarp down and shakes it to get the berries and then makes jam out of that. So um, in addition to that, you know, I like growing uh, beans and gr uh, greens because I like things that are forgiving. So I'm not growing specialty crops generally. Um, I want things that will be prolific and that just keep growing. And then I can just have, I'd be like, what are we going to have for dinner? I'm like, well, I think we got eight leaves of kale out there. That's what's for dinner. Um, and then lastly, rhubarb. I'm a big rhubarb booster. Uh, it started out in the early days of neighbor space. We noticed that people would plant it along the edge of the garden because nobody steals rhubarb because oh. people, nobody knows what it is. So no one would steal the rhubarb. They would take a tomato, but they wouldn't take the rhubarb. Um, and so I'm like, this is a beautiful plant. Um, nobody steals it. Um, and it's the perfect thing to match with berries to make any delicious jam. Um, so my son, seven years old, is the official rhubarb harvester. It's a great plant. I recommend it. When, um, when the humans are not at the garden gardening or watering, uh, do you find it? uptick in neighborhood dogs that wanted to have a little piece of the garden or rabbits or squirrels? Um, I mean, birds, I would say, is a, is yeah, a okay. big thing. There's a lot of gardens that are uh, realizing that the gardens are great for bird habitat and beneficial insects, butterflies and things like that, uh, native bees. Um, we definitely find that. Um, rabbits, I mean, people, it's more of a pest. Uh, rats, like the rest of Chicago, we have to deal with rats. Um, we have, that's something we've actually been dealing a lot with these last couple of years in a very concerted way, okay. um, helping the gardens deal with rats. Um, um, there are a few gardens that are, uh, have chosen to become part of the garden to be dog friendly areas. I think we have three of those. So they carve off a little piece of the garden and they manage it like they do the vegetable garden, uh, through the community together. Uh, and they manage it like a tiny little dog run that way. That's great. Um, as this webinar is entitled Empower Hour, please share a piece of advice uh, that are, can empower our attendees listening. Um, the biggest piece of advice that I have learned and that I often give people when I'm teaching, I've taught a little bit of it at DePaul, um, is inspired from 
something my wife calls me. She gave me the nickname Slow Zorro. Um, so, you know, Zorro would come in at the end and he'd like, choo, choo, choo. but that happened in a second. So she's like, you do the same thing, but you take 10 years to do it very slowly. Um, the lesson being that good things take time. Yeah. And the first solution you have is probably not the right one. And you have to take the time to look at things from different advantages, especially when you're dealing with public policy or, you know, intractable problems like food security. Uh, you have to keep at it uh, and try again, look at it from a different vantage, try again. And we have found at Neighborspace there there's projects that have taken seven to 10 years to come to fruition. Yeah. Uh, but I remember that first kernel, that little pilot light of this good idea of just neighbors wanting open space, wanting a place to play, wanting a place to get to the river. That little pilot light never went out and we kept it going and we waited for the stars to align. We waited for uh, something to ignite that, uh, the right funding source, um, you know, you name it. Uh, and some some ideas slip away, but some of them you keep at it. And then, and and now for some of those sites, like we're opening them this summer, you know, they're reality. And I remember that first meeting. I remember standing there with the community group in a vacant lot, overgrown, talking about like, hey, what if this were a play area? What if we had, what if we had raised beds over here? And uh, looking back, I'm like, what were we thinking? Uh, <laughs> but now it's there, you know, it exists. You stick with it and it exists. Um, and it's pretty remarkable, but good things take time. Ben, thank you very much. I really, really appreciate. Um, can you please provide your website, social media, and just ways people can learn more uh, about the organization, about how they can get involved with their communities? Um, that be, that'd be helpful, I think. Yeah, it's it's just neighborspace.org. Great. Um, and I would say, I mean, it's very important. Neighborspace does not exist without partners. Behind every garden is another organization or several. Um, and like with the community growers program, uh, most of the gardens we work with don't exist without also getting support from groups like the advocates for urban agriculture or a neighborhood group like Grow Greater Englewood or the uh, Chicago Community Growers Association. Um, so if you're interested in gardening or farming, I really encourage people to connect with those entities because that's where you're going to connect with people who've been through this before who can help you through it. That's great. Um, can you stay a little longer so we can sure. take some questions from the audience? Stella, how are we doing? Yeah, I have some. I have a little. Okay, great. <laughs> First question. Do the gardeners you work with view themselves as business owners? Oh. Some of them. Yeah. Um, some of them. Some of them have business licenses and view themselves as business owners and function in that way, especially with the growers program. Uh, there are other ones that view themselves as business owners that don't have licenses and it's done in a more casual way. Cover your ears, commissioner. No, uh, <laughs> it's no, it's done. It's the threshold. So it's like they're business owner. They're, they're on the upswing. They're starting out. Uh, the community garden or the urban farm is a place where they can have an entry point into the business world. And at a certain point, they're going to cross that threshold and need to get a business license and take it to the next level. Um, but if they're, you know, doing 50 jars of pickles, I'm not sure it breaks that threshold yet. It's the the whole uh, the incidental sales uh, clause that has been in existence at gardens forever. Uh, similarly, like there's you. farmers. There's in terms of the nomenclature, there are sites that call themselves farms that other people would look at and not call it a farm. And then so it's some of it's aspirational. Um, uh, the, you know, the words don't always line up with what the zoning is, let's say. So go ahead. Sorry. Alex, I see that you have your virtual hand raised. Can you please put your question in the chat so that we can get to it? Next question. What has been your favorite project? I mean, how can I possibly choose one? Um, I have many, many favorites. I mean, one of the things about community gardens and, and is that in community managed spaces is that really no two are exactly alike. Um, 
they literally come in different shapes and sizes and have different footprints. Um, I saw the folks from El Paseo on the call. I mean, that is an utterly unique space. It's huge. It's not this doesn't fit the model of any other community garden. Uh, it's absolutely extraordinary. It includes play areas, permaculture, bees, gathering sites, fire pits, uh, you know, small farms. And then you have sites like um, uh, the Hardincito in, in Little Village was the first nature place site that we ever worked on, which is near and dear to my heart because uh, it was a new idea, um, which now there's about eight or nine nature place sites that neighbor space protects. Uh, and I, and I, I love that because it represented it represented what people we heard, you know, it, it represented neighbor space responding to a need in communities. People wanted a place for their little kids to play in and they didn't want a playground. They wanted something more like a forest preserve experience. And we were able to, to help them deliver that. And it's really, really ex extraordinary. Um, there's other unique ones like the, uh, there's a little one in, uh, what is it on 42nd street in Bronzeville um, called the Oakland museum and garden, tiny little postage stamp of a garden. I love it because it's historic preservation. It is a site where a local sculptor uh, named Mitzenberg, who, uh, who actually created a sculpture for the park district across the street. Um, amazing sculptor. He had created works in wood in that space. And he passed away a few years ago and the neighbors band together to preserve the space in order to preserve his sculpture. Um, so I think it's just, you know, what, ama what, what amazes me is when the community amazes me by doing something unique like that. Uh, or the Riverbank neighbors in North Center, you know, in Lincoln Square, you know, banding together uh, to, to, to reclaim parts of the, of, of the river as a little community trail. Um, but yeah, there's just, there's so many examples. Here's Alex's question. Are the gardens growing organic yet? Uh, most of them are. Um, neighbor space is agnostic about it. We take super seriously that these are community run spaces. So we help with insurance, environmental safety resources, and then we get out of the way. Um, these are community led. So even a decision like that, that I may have a very strong opinion about uh, organic, it is up to the community how they approach it. Um, though I would say that most gardens, you know, do lean into organic. And can we just have one more question? Sure. Um, what recommendations do you have for working with multiple city departments? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, and we do work with multiple city departments. Um, I mean, be patient and be nice. Um, you know, for the most part, uh, like folks we work with, at, at especially at Business Affairs, who we've loved working with. I see, give a shout out to Brian, who I think is on the call there. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, and at planning and development and fleet and facilities and Department of Water Management and departments you've never heard of. Uh, you know, it can seem overwhelming. Um, but for the most part, people are are public servants who are trying to make things work in the best way they possibly can. Um, and I've seen some people getting angry and getting frustrated and kind of throwing up their hands. And I'm like, you can't do that. Uh, you got to figure out how to work with them as partners to thread the needle. Um, and uh, you can't ask, uh, you know, a public servant to skirt their own rules or break the law. Uh, you got to figure out how to make it work. So we get, you know, reasonably, we get farmers and gardens who are frustrated, like, how come we can't have access to this land? They're like, well, it's not environmentally clean yet. And we're like, well, we got to take the time to figure out how to do it properly. Uh, and we got to be patient and we got to be creative um, because it's not, and there's not necessarily a set script, especially when you're trying to do something that's like a little bit unorthodox. There's not always a set script inside the city about how do we do this? They have to be creative just like we do outside the city. They're like, well, how do we do this? No one's ever done this before. We have to invent and figure out how this fits within existing policy. If there isn't existing policy, we got to invent a pathway for this to happen. Um, 
but we, by being slow and steady and patient, like we've been able to, to really improve things. I mean, a big example is, well, is this new farm stand rules uh, with the Food Equity Council that we're able to get through. And now people can apply to have a legal farm stand. Uh, and it balanced all the different needs of people. Uh, similar thing with uh, Department of Water Management a couple of summers ago, working through, or now it's like three summers ago, um, working through how people can legally get access to city hydrants that also balance the need to 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 uh, to keep the city's water supply safe. Um, and so, uh, you know, sometimes we approach things with one need and then through working with the city, we realize like, oh, there are these other concerns that we have to balance it with, um, like the city's water supply <laughs> that is not inconsequential. Um, and we may not always get the solution we want that's perfect on the other end, but most of the time it's better than when we started. Uh, and it all keeps inching towards progress and more access for growing space and more ease of growing. But I would also say all of that with the caveat is you have to be persistent. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you have to push sometimes, push politely um, because, you know, I've been into city hall and different departments and there are stacks of projects this tall. Um, and there are a lot of competing needs and yeah. priorities and you do have to push to make sure that your project uh, gets attention. Uh, sometimes that means a bunch of neighbors calling. Uh, sometimes that means making sure your alderman calls on your behalf. Um, you don't want to make uh, the public servant's life miserable, but a little gentle pressure never hurts. Thank you, Stella. That's it. Mm -hmm. Okay, appreciate it. Thank you, Ben. And thank you to all of our attendees for joining today's Empower Hour. You can watch today's Empower Hour on our YouTube channel by visiting youtube.com slash Chicago BACP. For more information on our next Empower Hour, please visit chicago.gov slash business education. Again, Ben, thank you. Thank you to thank your you. organization. Thank you for your partnership. And certainly thanks for all the volunteers out there making Chicago more beautiful, more healthy uh, food options. And everyone have a great April afternoon. Thanks so much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.